Hello, welcome to New Scientist Weekly. This is the home of the most fascinating science and tech news. I'm Rowan Hooper in London. And I'm Christy Taylor in New York. This week on the podcast, Neanderthal genetics are revealing a whole new population of our ancient cousins. Plus, if you give a fish a mirror, they may rethink getting into a fight. And we're going to talk about space with the first civilian spacewalk just completed now and some cool findings from Europe's Planetary Science Conference. All that, and we've got a dispatch from Australia where our reporter James Woodford has just inhabited one of NASA's humanoid robots. So that's coming up. But first, let's talk about Neanderthals, because there's some fascinating news about our cousins this week. Alison George is here to tell us about it. Ali, what's the story? Yeah, this is the discovery of a lost Neanderthal tribe. Genetic analysis of a skeleton found in France reveals that it's from a previously unknown lineage that was a remnant of a much, much older population that remained in extreme isolation for 50,000 years or more, which is quite incredible. And this is Mm. shining new light on the last phases of this species' existence, which is a very hotly debated topic. Yeah, in other words, this is the mystery of why they went extinct. Before we get to this, I just have to say, Ali, they called the individual Thorin, which I (laughs) was just made to watch the entire movie trilogy of The Hobbit, so I can't get that out of my head. Any reason given for that? Well, in The Hobbit, Thorin is a dwarf king. And when I spoke to Ludovic Slimak, who discovered Thorin's remains and named him, he said, I won't repeat his wonderful French accent, um, that (laughs) Thorin is one of the very last dwarf kings under the mountain, the end of a lineage. And that's what Slimak thinks about the Neanderthal Thorin as well. He thinks he was one of the last members of the lineage. Neanderthal fossils have been given all sorts of interesting names, although there aren't that many of them. One was even called Elvis, because the only bit of him or her that was found was the pelvis, so Elvis the pelvis. (laughs) All right, fair enough. Let's get into it then. What does Thorin tell us about his lineage? Well, for a start, just finding him is amazing because very few Neanderthal skeletons have ever been found. And this one was particularly well preserved. They've got 31 teeth which is amazing, and bits of his skull. And he's still being excavated because they're doing it so painstakingly slowly um, to get it right. And teeth are a great place to find DNA. Initially, the researchers weren't very confident about being able to get Thorin's genome out of his teeth because DNA doesn't preserve in warm places. And this was in France. However, they were able to sequence his genome. And I say he because this sequencing revealed that he was male. But this also opened a massive mystery because the archaeological evidence and isotopes in his bones showed that he'd lived between, say, 42,000 years ago and 50,000 years ago, making him a a late Neanderthal from the final phase before they went extinct. But the genetics showed that he it seemed to be far, far older, like about 100,000 years ago, and they just couldn't work out what was going on. This didn't match up. What they realised is they'd in fact discovered a previously unknown lineage, but it hadn't got any information about. It didn't match any of the other known Neanderthal sequences. And they, Thorin and his group seemed to have been a remnant from when they split away from the main Neanderthal group about 100,000 years ago. And they stayed very isolated and didn't interbreed with others. So they looked like they were from about 100,000 years ago in their genes. So this is quite incredible. They didn't seem to mingle at all with other Neanderthals, even though we know they were close by. That's a long time to maintain a feud, isn't it? 50,000 years, handing it on, never mix with those other groups. I wonder why they did that. Um, but I mean, the, the isolation must have left them vulnerable, right? Really vulnerable. Well, on the other one hand, they survived for 50,000 years. But yeah, surely yeah. all the interbreeding and the sort of narrowness of the genetic diversity would have made them vulnerable. That's what that's what researchers think might have finished them off um, because they may be less able to adapt to changing conditions. And if you're socially isolated, you're not swapping ideas and technology with the local groups, and that might weaken your chances of survival as well. So you mentioned Ludovic Slimak, the guy who's been leading this research, and he wrote this book, The Naked Neanderthal. And in that, he says that we have gone too far in attributing cultural complexity to Neanderthals. And he says that's a form of racism. Can, can you tell us a bit more what he means about that? 
Well, I don't think he, he, he would certainly attribute cultural complexity to them. But it, what he says is that they're complex, but in a different way from us. He's got some very fascinating views of what it was like to be a Neanderthal and what their way of thinking about the world, because um, he spent literally decades in their spaces. The original view of Neanderthals when they were first discovered was that they were brutish, unintelligent thugs. Now that we think of them in a totally different way, that um, the sort of common view now is that um, they are just like us, just as intelligent, just as creative. But Slimak thinks that this sort of enlightened view is actually a sort of form of racism too. It's us projecting our ideas onto them. And in other words, we say to be human, you have to be like us. And he argues that Neanderthals evolved independently from us for about 400,000 years. So there's no reason why they should have developed ways of conceiving the world around them that were identical to ours. All right, we're all pretty aware that as our planet heats up, the weather is getting more extreme. But how much more extreme? And how can we tell whether a particular storm or heat wave is caused by climate change or something that we would have experienced anyway? The answer lies in a discipline known as attribution science. It is a fast developing field, and some recent advances could be truly game changing for how we understand the world's weather. Here to tell us more is environment reporter Madeline Cuff. Hey, Maddie. Hi, guys. So, Maddie, tell us about attribution science. Basically, attribution science is a way of figuring out the fingerprint of climate change on a weather event. So it enables us to say, for example, how much stronger a heat wave might have been because of rising temperatures or how much wetter or windier a storm might have been. So the idea is that it helps people to directly tie what's happening in the world around us to the climate. So you're not just experiencing weather, you're seeing evidence of how the planet is changing. Got it. So how does it work? How do they actually find that evidence? So it's with a lot of complicated modeling. So what researchers <laughs> do is they re-simulate an event twice using climate models. So the first is under present day conditions and the second is under pre-industrial conditions. So a world without any global warming. And the differences in the weather event between these two scenarios is essentially like the climate fingerprint on the weather event. There's been absolutely huge advances in attribution science over the last few years. It used to take months and months to analyse the climate impact of a specific event, but now researchers can do it in a couple of days. Maddie, so does this mean we're going to get this attribution in our weather forecasts? You know, like a, a forecast like saying there's going to be a heat wave next week and it's going to be this much worse because of climate change. Yeah, so to date, all climate attribution for weather events has been kind of happened after the fact. So we've had the event and then researchers have done the right, analysis yeah. to figure out what impact climate change had on that event. But what is the kind of next frontier of this is to apply this attribution science to weather forecasts. So hopefully we'll start to see that coming soon. I've been speaking to Peter Stott at the UK's Met Office and he's a, a world leading attribution specialist. And he says that we can start wrapping climate information into a weather forecast. And the reason you'd want to do this is so that you can start to improve public awareness of climate impacts and even kind of improve our strategies for coping with more extreme weather. So the Met Office in the UK is testing this idea. But a funny thing is that they've kind of already piloted it inadvertently. Back in 2022, maybe our British listeners will remember that the UK had a really hot summer and temperatures hit 40 degrees Celsius for the first time ever in the UK's history. And by chance, the Met Office had just completed an analysis looking at how much climate change had influenced the likelihood of the UK ever seeing 40 degree heat. So they could wrap in that attribution analysis into the public messaging of the forecast around the 40 degree heat. And that really helped to warn people that 40 degrees in the UK was unprecedented and really dangerous heat for the country to experience. Are there drawbacks, though, to using attribution in weather forecasting? There are a few. Yeah. So one issue is that the way the Met Office has been testing this approach is by using traditional weather forecasting models to run this analysis. But that's pretty time consuming and it requires access to really specialist expertise and heavy duty computer systems because they're crunching through these huge physics based climate models. But there could 
be a way around it potentially. You could use AI systems trained on climate models, which I've written about this week. There are some researchers in Spain testing this out. So essentially you would use an AI powered weather forecast to perform the same kind of attribution analysis. So again, one forecast run in a fictional kind of pre-industrial climate and another one run under real world conditions. And the AI models would be able to tell you how much climate change had had an impact on those events. And that would enable you to do this attribution analysis much faster than if you were running it on a conventional weather forecasting model. Okay, so yeah, if you can perform this kind of forecast analysis more quickly and cheaply, you could even sort of expand its use to events all around the world. Yeah, exactly. The idea is that this then wouldn't be limited to countries where you have a very sophisticated meteorological agency like the Met Office to run the analysis. You could potentially do it for lots of extreme weather events all around the world simultaneously, and you don't need a huge amount of processing power to do it. So it could really help kind of expand global public awareness of how extreme weather is changing. Yeah, and that could be a a great thing and a a necessary thing. But um, what about if it goes wrong? Because, you know, we're all used to moaning about weather forecasts going wrong. What if these attribution forecasts go wrong? And, you know, could that be something sceptics would pick up on? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly a risk. And the severity of that risk depends on the approach that you would take. Certainly for some of these AI systems, you want to make sure that they're trained on a lot of very high quality data before you kind of let them loose on creating forecasts. So there's a bit of work to do to make sure that this approach is really precise before we start using them to deliver some public messaging. But I mean, this field as I said before, has been advancing really rapidly and the quality of AI models is also advancing really rapidly. So I do think it's really only a matter of time before we start getting our weather forecast with a side of climate impacts. (laughs) Maybe a chance of meatballs. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Next up, we have a story about the fairest fish in all the land, the ones that look in mirrors and can actually tell how big they are which is kind of a cool trick if you're a fish. And we have a new story in the saga of self-aware animals to boot. Corinne Wetzel, this fish sounds really cool. Who is she? She is really cool. Um, Yeah, so this fish can do some pretty surprising things, things that usually are sort of reserved for... Things like humans and whales and crows and sort of the the smarties of the uh, animal kingdom. But this little fish is um, a coral reef fish. It's called a blue stripe cleaner wrasse, and it's about the size of my pinky finger. And last year, you might remember that these guys were the first fish ever to pass the mirror test, um, which is this like sort of famous test of self-awareness. Have you heard of this test? I mean, I've heard of a few different versions of this test. You're, we're basically seeing if animals can recognize themselves in different contexts. I know we've even talked about how chickens can pass a kind of audio version of the mirror test. Yeah, exactly. So basically, it's a test to see, you know, when you look in the mirror, are you understanding that the reflection staring back at you is yourself and not another being a stranger? And like I said earlier, the sort of smarties of the animal kingdom, whales, us, crows, elephants, they have all passed this, but no other fish has. So it was a bit of a shock when these guys passed that test. And that's the blue stripe cleaner wrasse? Blue stripe cleaner wrasse. Nice. And as part of the work where they found that these wrasse could recognize the reflection as themselves, they could also tell like photographs apart. So they could say, you know, that's a photo of Steve, not me, or that's a photo of me, not Steve. But what's really cool is now this same research team has just discovered that these fish can actually also check their reflection in the mirror and size up their body before they pick a fight with another fish. I'm actually not surprised that you think about cleaner wrasse because they they have a different kind of understanding than a regular fish, right? They have this relationship with bigger fish. They have to sort of have a theory of mind about the other fish that they go and clean, that they're not going to be eaten. So you know, it kind of makes sense that they have a higher cognitive ability. But how do they find it out? Because, you know, we don't have mirrors lying around in the ocean, right? No, exactly. So like so many acts of science, this started in the lab. So first, they just started with individual wrasse in a plain old glass tank, and they just held up a photo of another wrasse uh, to the glass. And even though these fish are quite smart, they They think that another photo of a fish is a fish and they'll try and fight it. (laughs) Um, And that's exactly what they found. They always tried to fight the fish in the photograph, regardless of if that fake fish was a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller than them. 
But then when they put mirrors in the tanks, that changed everything. So what changed in the context of this aggression when there was a mirror there? Right. So these fish then would first go to this mirror. They would look at themselves, sort of swim around, check themselves out. And then after that, they would swim over to the photo of the rival fish. And then they would make a decision. Am I going to fight this fish or not? And if it was smaller, they went for the fight. If it was bigger, they said, nope, not today. Right. So they are using the mirror to check out whether they're up to the fight or not. Yeah, that's what it seems like. And it's not like a side-by-side comparison. It's not like they're looking in the mirror, they're looking at this fish image, and they're deciding. Um, There's a partition in the tank that makes it so that they can't see their reflection and the rival fish at the same time. What the scientists actually think they're doing is building sort of a mental concept or idea of what their body size is, then swimming over to this fake fish and making their choice. So building this mental image of their body size is actually, that, that seems even more impressive to me. I'm, I'm convinced I would vote cleaner Rass for president. <laughs> um, but why on earth would a fish need to be able to do this in the first place? Like I'm thinking about, again, like the pressures of evolution. And it's not like they evolved in a world with mirrors. They didn't involve an environment where their ancestors who looked in mirrors and constructed this mental image and then fought a fish were more likely to survive, right? Right, right. So this sort of goes back to what Rowan was talking about a little bit earlier, and it comes out of sort of the life of the wrasse and what might benefit them in the wild. So these fish are very territorial in the wild, and it does benefit them to know what size they are before picking a fight. So it's more that these fish are using the mirror as a decision-making tool to help them make a better choice, sort of like we would look in the mirror and decide if an outfit looks okay before (laughs) heading out for the day. It's just a helpful tool. And learning that a tiny fish can do this, like very cool, obviously, but it also tells us a lot more about how self-awareness might have evolved in the animal kingdom. And that inherently tells us a little bit more about how self-awareness might have evolved in us. Well, let's change tack now to talk about some cool space stuff. On Thursday, private astronauts on a SpaceX mission performed the first ever civilian spacewalk. Let's hear a clip of it. Dragon, you've soared to over 1,400 kilometers, and you're farther from Earth than any other person since the last Apollo mission over 50 years ago. Copy that, SpaceX. Uh, We all look forward to our friends at the Artemis program to take us to even greater heights. I mean, that's pretty cool, isn't it? (laughs) Um, We do have to say it wasn't really a spacewalk like you might be imagining. The astronauts basically just stick their head out of the uh, the vehicle. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of like when Blue Origin kind of skimmed the very like edge of what is technically outer space on, I think, what was that, four years ago now? But technically, this was a stand-up extravehicular activity. Still pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know what, how to feel about this before because, you know, it's easy to snipe about these billionaires just going, oh, let's go into orbit. And then, oh, that's not enough for me. I need to go on a spacewalk as well. But you do have to hand it to SpaceX because this is historic. And SpaceX have designed this new space suit. It'd never been used in space before. It performed really well. There was an astronaut watching the live feed who was complaining like, oh, I wish I had those kind of spacesuits when I did my spacewalks because they are much better, uh, much mm-hmm. more maneuverable than the old kind. And, and Christy, guess what? What? Well, so he mentioned the Artemis program there and uh, NASA's Artemis program to return to the moon hasn't yet awarded a contract to someone to manufacture spacesuits. So maybe SpaceX were sort of advertising how good they are to get this contract. I mean, that's one heck of a grant proposal. Yeah, that's sort of what (laughs) just happened now. Yeah. Okay, so let's look a bit further afield, you know, past the moon now. Our reporter Alex Wilkins was at the Europlanet conference in Berlin this week. And there is loads of stuff going on in our solar system. But I have to say I'm kind of in love with the work some researchers have done documenting clouds on Mars. They're calling it a cloud atlas, which Mm. sounds very dreamy. Also the title of a very good speculative fiction book by author David Mitchell. Oh, yeah. What a great book. Um, Mm -hmm. Although there are no clouds in that book, weirdly, are there now I think of it? No particularly special clouds as far as I remember. But Mars's cloud atlas is interesting because Mars has a very different atmosphere from Earth. It's mostly carbon dioxide. And while you see some of the same clouds on Mars that you do on Earth, Mars also has some very different kinds of clouds. Uh, There are some enormous clouds that are made completely out of dust and look very red in the photos. And these can stretch hundreds of kilometers. 
Mars also has clouds that form because of some of its very tall mountains and volcanoes. These clouds can also mix with dust to look like volcanic eruptions, even though there is no tectonic activity on Mars anymore. And then there's kind of a cloud that forms only at twilight, which are actually very weird because they don't just have one shape. So instead, they can look like anything from these wispy, delicate cirrus clouds to just lots of strange blobs kind of clustered together. (laughs) They are really beautiful, quite dreamy pictures, Mm -hmm. as you say. Mm -hmm. And I like how they're also helping us understand uh, Mars's climate better as well. Right. There's science there, too. All right, it's time for some real life meets science fiction. Picture a humanoid robot and you might think of the Terminator or less frightening, maybe Commander Data from Star Trek. In real life though, roboticists have been hard at work at robots that can do gymnastics, play soccer, and maybe help with your household chores. But NASA is also working on humanoid robots. Its Valkyrie program has now built five with the goal of using this technology to support human activities in space someday. And one of those units has ended up in Perth, Western Australia, where our reporter James Woodford traveled recently to see what she is doing down under. Hey, James. So how was Perth? Hey, Christy. Thanks for having me back. Uh, Perth was lovely, crisp, cool, early spring weather, and almost the last place you'd expect to find one of the world's most advanced humanoid robots. (laughs) Well, it's definitely far from the moon or Mars. So what is a NASA Valkyrie robot doing there? Well, as you may know, Western Australia is in the middle of a massive mining boom and hosts some of the biggest energy and resources companies in the world. Uh, One of those is Woodside, a company that has an array of liquefied natural gas plants and big offshore extraction operations. The company has had a long running relationship with NASA and even helped test its Robonaut 1 and Robonaut 2 models. And basically, Woodside wants to find ways of getting machines to take over some of the dangerous tasks undertaken by humans in inhospitable environments. Aha, so like on drilling rigs or other sort of gas extraction activities? Exactly. All right. Yeah, that sounds like it could be a bit like space or the moon or Mars. Yes. And and in fact, Sean Azimi at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, told me, that Woodside's facilities are a great proving ground for a robot like Valkyrie, where you can see natural parallels to a future lunar or Mars base. Basically, it's a place for testing the robot's abilities and the engineering solutions for problems that an organization like NASA may encounter along the way. Got it. And yeah, I imagine it's a lot easier to send in humans to troubleshoot in Perth than it might be on the moon. So... Was it fun to meet Valkyrie? Yeah. What's this robot like? Yeah, I have to say, you know, I was really excited about going to to meet the robot. And it turned out to be one of the most amazing experiences of my career. I wow. once got to spend some time for a story alone with astronaut Buzz Aldrin. And it may sound hard to believe, but meeting Valkyrie was almost as special to me. All <laughs> the researchers shortened Valkyrie's name to Val and refer to her as a she, I wrote in my story that seeing her humanoid form for the first time was both awe-inspiring and also a little bit disorienting. For starters, imagine a machine that is part Transformer, part Star Wars Stormtrooper in appearance, and with these crazy hands that look like they can crush beer cans, She's (laughs) She's <laughs> 1.8 meters tall and weighs 120 kilograms. So she definitely cuts an intimidating figure. Uh, first of all, I got to watch the team run her through some of her party tricks. And then I was really caught off guard because they invited me to take her for a spin myself. Uh, hang on there. How do you take a robot for a spin? Is this like a remote control point and wave sort of situation? There's a few ways of controlling Valkyrie, but one of the main ways is actually with virtual reality. So goggles, handheld controllers, etc. And I have to tell you that it was weird. Once I'd put on the goggles, I could see a digital version of Valkyrie in front of me. And on the floor, there's a digital hexagon. And I was instructed to walk towards that hexagon. And Mm. as soon as I was there my body 
basically merged into the robots. So my hands are now her hands and my head is now her head. There's a voice command I have to give before I'm fully controlling her. But once I do that, the robot follows everything I do with my head or hands and I'm seeing what she's seeing with the cameras in her face. Wow. It's a bizarre sensation actually feeling and perceiving the world like the robot, which researchers describe as riding the skin. And there's a command to end the session too. And then you literally step backwards out of her body and remove the mask. Yeah, that sounds like a really incredible experience. And I also guess like in the vision of humanoid robotics, that'll end up just being someone's very boring job someday, just controlling a robot with VR as they fix stuff in space or do maintenance on an oil rig. So, I mean, is all that what's next for Valkyrie? Actually, no. These models will not be going to space or be deployed at sea. The Valkyrie program is now over a decade old, and these models are coming to the end of their working lives. But the idea is that what we have learned from Valkyrie and all of the other amazing developments in robotics and AI will go to space and all these mm -hmm. other harsh environments. Those learnings will be incorporated into a new generation of machines. And it is almost certain that the successes to Valkyrie, even if not humanoid in form, will one day be part of the Artemis lunar missions or even trips to Mars. You can read more about James's trip to see Valkyrie and watch a video of what it was like to control this robot on our website. We'll put a link in the show notes. That's it for this week. If you like the show and think more people should know about us, do give us a five-star rating or even a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We've got more fascinating stories from New Scientist on our website at newscientist.com. We'll be back next week. Bye for now. Bye. This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk.